there's there's such a pressure on guys especially but i think it's for leaders often in general to to know everything you know and for you to you know this is not disclosing you know the most painful moment of your childhood uh it's not you know sharing you know whatever kind of challenges you've had raising your kids or with your spouse but just to say in your in your executive team meeting or to your whole company I, you know i don't know the answer to that but i'm going to study it when a question comes up or do you know disclose from, from the get-go i you know there's a there's something i want to learn more about i i don't understand this cryptocurrency stuff and, and i think we should should understand it that move is a as kind of a we'll call it a low-hanging fruit vulnerability move and it's so important Welding together practical insights and powerful conversations to forge world-class leaders. This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. Now, here's this week's host, Brandon Smith, co-founder of the Leadership Foundry. Folks, I'm really excited about my conversation today. I've got on the show today, on our Leadership Foundry podcast show today, we've got Ed Frohenheim, and he was one of the main senior content directors at Great Place to Work. In our show today, we spent some time talking about really the future of leadership. So Ed got the wonderful experience of doing so many research interviews, surveys, and just just exploratory deep dives into organizations doing leadership right. So on our conversation, we talk about the history of leadership. We talk about how it's been evolving in the last five years, and we even look into the crystal ball. I think you're going to get a lot out of this conversation just hearing Ed's perspective on where he's seen leadership go and what it means for each and every one of us. So take good notes, identify that one thing you can start doing, stop doing, or continue doing that's gonna make you a better leader, not only today, but more importantly, tomorrow. Ed, I'm really excited about our conversation today. You know, I whenever I get an opportunity to talk a little bit about the future of leadership, I just love that because it's such a fun conversation. There's no real right or wrong answer to it. And given a lot of the work you've done at Great Place to Work and, and some of those other kind of aspects that you've got around leadership, I'm really curious to your perspective on this, kind of what you've learned, what, what you're seeing. But before we jump into all that, for my listeners, share a little about who you are and, and how you got doing this. Sure. Thanks, Brandon. And it's an honor to be here with you. I would say that I got into this as primarily a journalist, uh, as a writer uh, focused on the workplace uh, and technology companies, especially um, going back about uh, 25 years or so. Uh, eventually uh, focused in on the topic of, of leadership and HR and people management matters at Workforce Magazine for about six or seven years. And then I moved to Great Place to Work, which uh, many readers may or listeners may know is a, uh, an expert on workplace culture, surveys employees. It's a uh, great place to work is behind the Fortune 100 best companies to work for list every year. So uh, this is my kind of journey took me to focusing on, on great cultures where people thrive and, and the organization does well. And I, uh, for six years, I was a great place to work. And we studied leadership at some of these best workplaces around the world and found some pretty interesting things along the way. Yeah, Ed, that's fantastic. So let's go back in time a little bit. So I know we're talking about future, but I think you can't really do future right if we haven't set up context. So let's go back. Let's go back. I don't know. I got my MBA in 2005. So let's just go back to 2005. As best as you can remember, or, or even trying to paint that picture, what was leadership all about in 2005? What, what, what would you say are some of the hallmarks of that style of leadership or, or maybe kind of our, our, our prior generations of leadership? I, I think that's a neat time capsule ex- exercise, Brandon. Uh, I would say that at that point, we still had a pretty conventional notion of leadership. Uh, where the CEO uh, or top executives are supposed to be decisive. They're supposed to be charismatic. Uh, they're probably extroverts, uh, comfortable talking in, in, uh, to large groups of people and, and thinking on their feet. Um, and they probably are uh, pretty comfortable giving directions, uh, really kind of seeing themselves as, as the, the main decider of things. Um, you know, as, as your leaders well, your listeners well know, it's also a very male dominant time, uh, which has been changing over time. But it's probably, you know, I think we still have less than 5% C- female CEOs in the, the Fortune 100, say. So it's going to be a pretty, uh, you know, something of a boys club uh, at that top as well. Okay. And a, and a very white one, <laughs> just to, to, yeah. to put another uh, ob- observation on it. Yeah. So we've got these 
kind of um, white male leaders, charismatic, decisive. Um, I, I put down kind of like central decider, like they're going to make the one that they're going to be the decision maker. They're going to make that, that decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, and so, so that was kind of how it was. Now let's get up to maybe the point you started doing research. When did this start to change? When did you start to notice a change, see a change? And what were some of the things that started to change? I would say in the last five years or so, there's been some sea changes, some big changes um, underway and in leadership. And uh, we, a great place to work, um, did a study of, of leadership in, in 2018 as we were putting together our uh, book called A Great Place to Work for All. Um, and we, we saw that uh, you know, there were some real changes in going on in the world that, that led to, to leadership having to change. And when I think about the changes in the world that were significant, I like to sum, up, sum them up with three Fs. It's a faster world, it's a flatter world, and it's a more fairness-focused world. And by the faster one, I'm talking about digital transformation, uh, disruptions in all kinds of industries that can happen overnight, practically, uh, where you can have threats and opportunities that surface quickly. Uh, the flatter world is related to that because uh, businesses are realizing they have to like distribute authority more and allow people throughout the organizations to respond in real time to threats and, and opportunities. Uh, so you can't wait. It's too slow to wait to send information up to that central decider we just talked about and have him send a direction back down. You got to really let your people have uh, authority to, to decide and trust them. Um, and then the fairness focus piece really has to do with the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the focus on LGBTQ folks and, and, and the, the realization we haven't really had a just world and nor has our business world been just fully either. And so leaders have got to account, uh, account for all these changes and really adapt to this world. And what we learned is that the, you know, the resulting skills and, the, and uh, criteria for, sex, for success have really changed. You know, you lay those out and we, I hear it and I say, oh, yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense. But then when I start to combine them in my head, I think to myself, that's really hard. Like, that's a really hard task. Yeah. I, I think about our friends in like private equity. I've worked a lot with private equity leaders. Private equity leaders move very fast, very, very fast. Fairness is not necessarily top of mind for them, at least from in terms of, of a social justice. They're all about performance. It's, I mean, I, I, I don't want to put this in a negative category, but a lot of those things around that have to do with politics, some of those, some of those issues, yeah. they are not interested in that. It's what have you done for me lately? And if you deliver this month, you, you still have your job. You don't deliver this month, you're fired. Like that's how private equity works. So we've, that makes sense when you think about faster and flatter, right? We've got to move fast. But now we've now got to consider all these other components that are more about you know, um, humanity and, and treating people fairly. Mm -hmm. And yet performance is accelerating. Yeah. So I don't know if you have like the silver bullet or the secret sauce or the magical code, but I, I would love to get your thoughts at how do, yeah. how, how do leaders strike that balance? Well, we did find some uh, interesting findings that really do point toward a, uh, a portrait of this leadership of the future, or at least of the moment. And I think it, it, it's, a, it's a portrait that's going to have legs into the future. And we ended up calling it the for all leader. Uh, and that is to say, the leader that is creating a great experience at work for all, uh, for just about every one of their employees and 90% plus are really having a great experience in their survey data. This is a, a, a study of 75,000 employees and 10,000 managers that we conducted. And we discovered that the, the, the managers that were most inclusive, where 90% plus had a great experience when we, sur when we surveyed them, they also were the most productive. They had the highest uh, scores for uh, productivity on measures of agility and retention. So they're holding on to their people and their people are agile, they're innovative and they're productive. Uh, and then we then said, well, what are these people like? And we looked at the comments that employees made about these leaders and, and, a, and a very different persona showed up from that 15 year ago one that you asked about initially. These for all leaders are humble. They, let, they, sit, they sit back and let others take the credit for, for their team's um, you know, successes. They're also very much about creating bonds of trust. So they really focus on that people piece and how the work gets done. Uh, and they're very purpose oriented. So they're not just focused on those quarterly results. They're focused on that like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Let's, get, let's achieve our mission here uh, so that it really inspires people to do their best work. And so even though it, it's, it's a little counterintuitive that these folks that are 
you know, attending to the soft stuff are really successful today. They're getting the hard results and they're also have creating a great experience for the people. Wow. Okay. So if a leader was listening to this right now, which they are, and they say to themselves, okay, all right, I, I, I hear you, Ed, I, I want to get better at this. Is there a starting place? Where, 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 where can they start down this path to become a kind of a for all leader? I think the first place to start is listening. Mm. Leaders historically have been about speaking. You know, let me tell you what to do. <laughs> you know, and, but it, these for all leaders and, and leaders that are working to be for all leaders really focus on understanding what their people are going through. And I think we've had a great opportunity during this, you know, the last couple of years of crisis, the pandemic, the racial uh, reckoning, uh, even anxiety about climate change, all these things, political polarization, there are opportunities to understand what your people are experiencing, what, they, what their hopes and dreams are besides their anxieties. Uh, and when you do that, when you spend, spend the time to do that, you open up tons of new doors and, and you really win the trust of your people and you build these positive bonds that are so important. You know, we know now from the research at Google and elsewhere about psychological safety and how that's the key to success for the teams, at, the most effective teams at Google, not the PhDs, not the number of, of high tier schools that were on that team. It's rather that people feel safe enough to, to be vulnerable. And so you need a, a leader who can be vulnerable themselves and who can create that, that's, that uh, atmosphere of, uh, of trust and of safety so that uh, when they listen to their people, uh, that that's the first step really to create that kind of positive workplace atmosphere. So I just, I just, cause I have to ask the question, is there a step two? <laughs> uh, I'm not exactly sure there's a super clear step two or so much as knowing that there's a step one, but I would say that, you know, those other elements I mentioned before of the, for all leader, these characteristics of being focused on your, on the purpose, being frequently uh, calling out the, you know, frequently calling out that goal. What is the highest, uh, highest purpose of your organization so that you are elevating their, uh, their spirits, really, and, you know, and inspiring folks to, to, to bring their best work and their creativity? Um, and the humility. You know, the humility is, not, is partly about sharing authority. That's that good, speaks to that, that flatness piece. It's also about uh, celebrating your, your team's achievements and, and not trying to take the credit yourself. Um, you know, that... that is no longer really acceptable, especially as younger people come in the workplace. They want to get the feedback for what they've done. They want to get credit for what they've done. And that older school approach of, of really kind of being the barking boss who, who steals the limelight is, is, is kind of that, that era is over with really. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, I mean, you've painted some, a, a compelling picture for us. Uh, what I think is going to be so challenging for so many leaders that I work with is yet there's so many expectations for results on them. So it's almost like yeah. we're expecting them to go a little bit, you know, uh, in an almost unnatural way. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big baseball fan and I'm a big baseball fan. And there was a famous pitcher for the Atlanta Braves I'm here in Atlanta named Greg Maddox, Hall of, of Fame pitcher. He's got you know, four Cy Youngs. And he was once asked, what's the difference between a good pitcher and a great pitcher? And he said, good pitchers, when they get into trouble, they throw harder. Great pitchers, when they get into trouble, they throw softer. Interesting. Which I think was really interesting because it's, it's so unnatural. It's like, I'm in trouble, so now I'm going to throw a 75-mile-an-hour pitch yeah. curveball? Why would I do that? I'm, you know, I'm struggling here. But that throws people off, or, or in this case, it, it helps them kind of reset versus doing the same thing harder. I'm using that analogy mm -hmm. because I'd love to get your thoughts on the leaders that are feeling really, really in trouble. They're feeling like there's a lot of results. I feel like I got to, I got to hold on to the steering wheel harder or got to get yeah. in there and like do the work because there's so much pressure. And yet what you're really telling us is the most successful ones learn to throw softer. How, mm. how can, how can we make that shift? Any, any thoughts? I think a key is to start with yourself and to start with sort of self-awareness. When you get into those tense moments, like you're just describing Brandon about like, they're feeling the pressure to get the, 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 the quarterly results looking great. If you can become more uh, um, competent at managing your emotions, which starts with being, a, with being aware of them, that's going to go a long ways uh, to being able to prevent, provide these uh, great workplace environment characteristics like the, the, the trust, the psychological safety. So yeah, I would say start with your own kind of self-awareness and then 
And these days, especially self-compassion, you know, acknowledge when you're hurting and you need to like, you might need a, you know, a time with a therapist. You might just need a hug from your, your partner. Um, but to be willing to be vulnerable and to sort of take care of yourself first so that you can take care of others. It's that old airline thing. You put your mask on before you put your kids' masks on if the oxygen drops. So that, that, I would say that's a really important piece of the puzzle. So Ed, this is really, this ties into something. So, you know, you're the co-author of Reinventing Masculinity, Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection, which I think is really important to even this topic. I'm going to have you on at a, at a later point, just on the Workplace Therapist Show to do a deeper dive into that topic. But, you know, part of what you're, you're saying to us is we've got to maybe revisit some of those old school mindsets, whether we're female or male, but particularly that, that old school male mindset of can't ask for help. Don't show weakness. Got to be tough all the time. What yeah. you're telling us is that that isn't, that's not going to play. So I'd be curious to me, your thoughts around that. Yes, I think you're exactly right. Uh, what we call confined masculinity in, in our book, my book with Ed Adams uh, is exactly the, the kind of masculinity you describe, Brandon, of, of thinking you have to be stoic. You've got to be dominating, hyper-competitive. You can't ask for help. You've got to be independent to the point of isolation, really. Uh, and those are qualities, you know, they can be, you know, they're good in, in certain contexts, but they've really limited men in terms of how they can relate to others and, and the kind of roles they can play. And, you know, basically in, in the, the work world that's showing up and the, the kind of leadership uh, expectations that are out there, it's a bad fit. Because right now, if you show up as that traditional man, you're going to come across as rigid, cold, and isolated in a world that's not really calling for agility, warmth, and connection. And so mm. you've got to upgrade, uh, update, and expand your, your masculinity the way you see yourself as a man. We call it a liberating masculinity, which frees your, you know, men and all those around them to live fuller lives at work, at home, at play, and in the world. Yeah. So I wrote that down. I think you made a really compelling point that I think we all really need desperately, maybe even more so than even before the pandemic. It seems like it's just getting worse. We, we need kind of that agility, of course, but warmth and connection. You know, I think that's, I mean, who doesn't need that right now? Uh, There's some beautiful examples too. Uh, I know we haven't really given many, talked about many examples, but can I, can I share one example? From, I love my, stories. Okay. I love examples and stories. So you have the floor, my friend. Well, one of my favorite stories of, of a guy that I would really call a liberating man is uh, Tim Ryan, one of the top executives uh, at, at PwC, the a big professional services firm. And he has been, since he took the reins of, of the company several years ago, really been a pioneer in exploring some of the fairness pieces. He's uh, explored the role of, of racial injustice and both, both within his own company and then beyond. He created an organization called CEO Action for um, for diversity and inclusion. And he then this, during the pandemic was a pioneer in being vulnerable. Uh, he, uh, we did, we did a, a telecast with him, um, where he took a call from his daughter's bedroom on zoom about what PwC was doing. So he's kind of acknowledging he's at home with everybody, like everybody else, not looking at like in a fancy office. It's like a, you know, a peaked room, like the, the top floor of his house. And he also acknowledged that his family was experiencing mental health challenges. And so for a, for a leading CEO to disclose that, that his family is being touched by something that for so long has been stigmatized, uh, I thought was really powerful. And here's that warmth and connection you were just talking about, Brandon, coming from a leader of a, of a, of a company that's in an industry considered dry, you know, accounting, you know, and here he is bringing, bringing the, uh, the good juju to a field that can be very cold and, you know, not Surprisingly, his company is doing very well. It, it, it's and its employees routinely rated as one of the, the top workplaces in the country. Okay, I love this, Ed. So I've got another question for you. So often, when I'm teaching trust, I, I, I share a trust formula that I, I developed a few years ago, and it's it's authenticity plus vulnerability in mm. parentheses multiplied times credibility gets us trust. Mm. I love and that. The, and the reason why I do the multiplier in the middle is if credibility goes to zero. Well, trust goes to zero. You multiply anything by zero, you get zero. If yeah. authenticity and vulnerability go to zero, then, then trust also goes to zero. 
Now, I was doing a session, in fact, earlier today for um, a credit union out in, in, in Washington, uh, the state of Washington. And, you know, we were talking about the trust formula. And um, one of the points came up and I said, you know, all of those variables are really important, but it's kind of like cooking a dish. They're all ingredients. They're all really important, like vulnerability, for example. But you can overdo on any one of those ingredients, right? So it's mm-hmm. possible to be too vulnerable. Now, yeah. it's pretty hard to do that, but it is possible. And I think that's a big fear for people. They're like, oh, you know, I yeah, want to yeah. be too vulnerable. Then people are going to think I'm weak. Mm-hmm. So for people that have never really stretched this muscle before, given some of the stories that you've seen and examples, what are some easy ways they can dip their toes into the world of vulnerability and authenticity? What are some easy, I hate to use the phrase low-hanging fruit, but what's the, <laughs> what are the low-hanging fruits here, Ed? acknowledging you don't know something. Oh, great. There's, there's such a pressure on guys, especially, but I think it's for leaders often in general to, to know everything, you know, and for you to, you know, this is not disclosing, you know, the most painful moment of your childhood. Uh, it's not, you know, sharing, you know, whatever kind of challenges you've had raising your kids or with your spouse, but just to say in your, in your executive team meeting or to your whole company, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to study it when a question comes up. Or do you know disclose from from the get go? I you know there's a there's something I want to learn more about. I, I don't understand this cryptocurrency stuff, and and I think we should should understand it. That move is a as kind of a we'll call it a low hanging fruit vulnerability move, and it's so important. You know, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella talks about how we need to go from know it alls to learn it alls, and and that requires vulnerability. Mm. Yeah. So I think that would be a, a, a good first place to, to get on the vulnerability uh, path. Yeah, I love. I think that's great. Uh, it's easy, easy, easy way to think about it. know it alls to learn it alls. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna now take. We've we've talked about the past. We've talked about trends and how things have evolved the last five years. Here comes the fun part, Ed. It's my <laughs> it's my crystal ball. So if I put my crystal ball out in front of you, and you look out, I don't know. Maybe it's five years. Maybe it's ten years. Maybe we do like. Another 15, and we got another 15 years. Uh, what, what do you see as the future of leadership? What is, what is a leader going to look like in 5, 10, 15 years? What, what does she look like? What does he look like? What are some of the traits, behaviors that are going to allow them to be successful in this world we're in? Thank you for inviting me to look in your crystal ball with you, uh, Rand. And what I see is a shift from leaders trying to be the man of steel to becoming men or people of teal. That is to say, mm. moving from this superhero mindset where you've got to be invincible, you got to save the day single-handedly, uh, you've got to be super strong. And all those things lead to some of the problems we've mentioned before. This is the past, the isolated, rigid, cold stuff. To when I talk about being a man of teal or a people of teal, that's referring to what I see as the future of organizational cultures, uh, teal organizational cultures. Um, this is a term that refers to companies that are more soulful and they have three main characteristics. They're holistic. They, they really account for the entirety of our human emotions and even spiritual needs. They're self-managed. So they're much more about shared authority and, and democracy in the workplace and they're purpose driven. They're really not focused on making a profit. The profit is secondary to them solving a big problem. And when leaders show up for those in those organizations and embrace those, those key pillars of a teal organization, they are what we described earlier. They are agile. They're able to kind of learn quickly. They don't uh, worry about their title, say they're worried about the purpose. So they, they can, they can shift and, and learn something or, or even put somebody else in charge uh, for, for, for a project. They're also warm because they're, they're attuned to people's emotional needs, not just the, the sort of the job descriptions that they're, they're supposed to take care of. And they're connected. They're connected to, to their people and their, and also to the planet, and to the wider ecosystems in which we operate. Um, and so I think that this teal consciousness, which is really part, it's a wider human uh, development that, that some theorists like Ken Wilber talk about with a series of colors. Um, this is, I think, where the world is going. Where we're, we're now seeing in, in, in the pandemic in the past couple of years, we are in one ship together here. And that level of consciousness that we can't see our companies as isolated, we can't see ourselves as isolated. We can't treat our teams just as, as cogs in a machine or, or superheroes that are you know, not really human. We've got to recognize that we are human and we're all connected 
And the leaders that are going to be thriving in the future are the ones that are like that for all leader and maybe go a little further in terms of sharing authority and really embracing all the kinds of emotional needs that can come up and including seeing ourselves connected to our entire environment. You know, it's really interesting as you were talking, um, what was going through my head was that whole idea of going from working in the business to on the business. It's a common, often you know, mm-hmm. used term, particularly in the entrepreneurial space. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, oh, that's what he's saying. And I thought, wait, that's not really what he's saying. And then I thought, I think this might be what he's saying. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to try and take what you said and put it into that lens. Yeah. Okay. So today, a lot of the challenges I hear from all the leaders I work with is- well, they get Can dry. I just interrupt for a second, Brandon? Yeah, Maybe sure it's right. working through the business I, I because think, you're, you're, you're using the business in service of a better world. I think, that's, I, I think that's even a better way to put it than what I was going to put it because today, so much of the leaders are, fo- they get drawn into the business doing the work. Yeah. You're not saying become distant and you're going to be up in this, you know, top of the mountain and, you know, you're sitting there and kind of, you know, thinking about the world and thinking about, you know, uh, something very kind of noble all the time. You're not necessarily saying that you're saying you're still involved in business, but you're in well, the parts you're involved in are the people and the energy and the emotions, not mm-hmm. the actual work itself. So, and I think that's an interesting distinction, which maybe is part of like doing it through the business. So it's, it, you're, you're still engaged, but you're not, you're not, you're asking people like, how are you? How can I support you versus this is how I want you to do this thing. It's a, yeah. it's a little little different conversations. It's what it sounds like. Yeah, I think that's, I, I like how you put it there. I, one great example of, of what maybe is the, the most famous and prominent Teal organization and Teal leader is a fellow named Joseph de Bloch, who's the head of a, a Netherlands uh, home healthcare agency called Burtzark. And basically he, he started this alternative to like more top-down healthcare companies in the Netherlands and said, we're going to have teams of nurses manage themselves. And I and I'm he he had experience in this world and it was frustrating to him and he he knew that people that were delivering the care knew how to take care of the issues and they knew how to solve the problems on their own so he as a leader is much more just a servant who's supporting as you were describing it and these teams of nurses they set budgets they hire they train and they are the most successful uh, organization in this territory in the in in the Netherlands and more and more organizations are trying to learn from them. So I think you're right in the sense that these leaders of the future are going to be coming more, you know, leaders of the, maybe leading through the business. If we've coined that term together here, as opposed to only being in the weeds or thinking way above it. Uh, There's a lot of focus on the people and, and supporting them and helping the, even helping the people to collectively set the strategy. I think that's one of the distinctions in the future is we're going to get smarter about wisdom of the crowds as leaders. We think we have to know it all again, when it comes to setting the direction but there's so much intelligence and knowledge that, and, and intuition even that we miss when we just shut ourselves in the room or maybe with one or two of our closest lieutenants. More and more, there's ways of gathering that, that, that smarts, that, that, uh, that sense of what's going on and how our organization is called to, to move today and then how to, how to accomplish our purposes. So this will be our, our last kind of big, because we already have to land our plane. So this will be kind of the last big question, but I'm curious for you that last comment you made around getting that information from what's going on in the, in the organization. Historically, it's been surveys, employee engagement surveys to be even more, more specific. Mm-hmm. And not bad necessarily, but uh, the organizations I work with, fund, the fundamental problem is there's not that, that full circle ecosystem of communication where yeah. communication mm-hmm. goes down, it gets translated down to the, and then, and then there's feedback that comes back up, you know, where, the, where yeah. those frontline leaders say, well, this is why this works or doesn't work senior leader. And we need, and then that, and then hearing that and then adjusting that whole like circle of life, like that's not happening. It's just, it goes down and then it stops and there's no way to get that, get that information back up. Have you seen anything that works? Or even if you look in the crystal ball, could, can you imagine anything that might work? I think there are ways for this to work. And some of them are, they do take time and effort to, you know, make sure you are synthesizing that, that those employee surveys, that is a source of good data. And then kind of making sure you, you communicate back to the the staff, what you heard and what, what you plan to do with it. But there's also, I think, you know, a whole new body of, or it's not totally new, but there are some alternative methods of gaining that wisdom of the crowd, like uh, having people work in small groups, and share what their ideas are. And then you start having, you spread those, you share those across the organization, have people vote up what, what's interesting to them. 
um, you know, you can get a lot of clarity by that sort of bottom-up wisdom. Uh, and then you can start, you know, inviting people to have to work on those projects with cross-disciplinary teams, teams that are cross-level. So you include people from the front lines all the way to the top. And, and some of the best workplaces do that sort of thing. So there's, you know, to your point of working with the people issues, there's more attention that I think needs to be spent on gathering that collective understanding and that collective desire uh, and collective intelligence than we've done so far in organizations. Yeah, that's great, Ed. So I ask all my guests this question. So as we're starting to lay in the plane, um, particularly for the Leadership Foundry Show, uh, I'm going to tweak this question just a little bit. Okay. So I would be curious, when you, what is one main hack you have for us that every single leader listening to this can use that will, could make them a better leader starting tomorrow? What's one thing they could start doing differently that will start to get them closer to this kind of leader for all? Ask people to tell their life stories in a minute. It's a tactic that I picked up from a leader, the head of, of uh, either belonging or, or uh, diversity and belonging at, at Salesforce, Tony, Tony uh, Profit. And he, he came in and did a little demonstration. He's like, okay, turn to your neighbor and tell your story in a minute. And it was a remarkable exercise because it, it, it prompted people to think holistically you know, about who they are, what, what motivates them, what drives them. If leaders can invite their team members and their peers to share more of who they are, then those leaders can connect with them better. They can build those, those bonds and they can create a higher performing team. Wow. That's a really, uh, that's a challenge a minute, huh? Wow. Okay. I sometimes extend it to 90 seconds. I, and I, I stole it <laughs> as I write a lot of articles, I've stolen as a way to like, just get to know someone at the beginning of an interview is say, tell me your, tell me your story in, in, in 60 or 90 seconds. So uh, if you need 90 seconds, that's okay. Yeah. And I love that. That's fantastic. Great way to, as you said, to, not only get you thinking about who you are and how you show up, what matters to you, but you learn a lot about the other person. You can connect with them very quickly. Yeah. So Ed, this is great. If people want to follow you, learn more about you, get a copy of your book, where, where can they go? You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also uh, go to my website at brownheim.com. And also uh, the Teal Team website is uh, the teal And um, my the, the book with that Adams is available on Amazon. So any of those places, I'm happy to connect and you know, would love to continue the conversation. Well, Ed, this is great. Thanks for all the work that you've already done, the work you continue to do. And thanks for uh, spending some time with me in my crystal ball. I, I've, I've learned a lot. I love the picture that you're painting. I think that's a really inspiring picture of leadership. And I think it inspires everyone listening to the show today to do what they can to get closer to that. So thank you for all that advice and encouragement. Thank you, Brandon. As I do on all the shows, folks, I always take lots of notes. I took lots of notes. I'm not going to go over all my notes in detail, but I am going to hit some of the highlights that stood out for me with my conversation with Ed. Well, first, he talked about the change over the last five years. And he said, look, the world has gotten faster. It's gotten flatter. And frankly, it's become a more fair world. And so the demands for us on, as leaders is really changing. And he talked about that turning us into this for all leader. And I said, well, Ed, what does it really mean to be a for all leader? And he said, he said, really, the best leaders, they really create these inclusive environments where they are leading with humility. Um, they're focusing on bonds of trust and they're constantly hitting that drumbeat of purpose. And I think that's quite a call to action for all of us. And what stood out for me that is going to be so challenging for each and every one of us is that Ed essentially said, we've got to spend time moving away from doing the work, being kind of being in the business, like I always talk about going from in the business to on the business. And we've got to think more about how do we lead through the business and through the people. And that's a different kind of leadership skill altogether. But I know if we stay focused on it and we really practice it, we can all get better on it. So think about what was your takeaway from today? Was it something different than that? I would love to hear any comments on the show. Email me directly. If there was something that stood out for you that either you found really insightful or challenging, uh, let me know. I I'd love to take that on so we can all learn together. But as with all these shows, the goal is for you to take that one thing away. It's going to help you become better, not only today, but tomorrow.